Did I do wrong? Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I've been given the green light to, uh, to start. I'd like to start by recognising the traditional owners of this land, the Awabakal and the Waramai people, and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Good morning, everyone, and welcome. Uh, for those who are joining the Hunter Global Summit for the first time today, my name is Joe James. I'm the CEO of the Hunter Joint Organisation, uh, and I'm your MC for today. I'll give you a bit of background as to why we're here. Many of you will have heard it already, but to support the region in capitalising on the opportunity that the airport presents, the 10 Hunter Councils through the Hunter JO launched Hunter Global, our international future, uh, as a region-wide initiative to boost collaboration, to boost planning and to boost advocacy. Um, I want to uh, welcome the mayors who are with us today, uh, Morris Collison from Upper Hunter Shire Council, John Connors from Dungog Shire Council and Sue Moore from Singleton Council. Um, I mentioned yesterday, but I think it's worth repeating, just as important as collaboration itself is between the councils is the leadership of the, the mayors themselves. And we think about um, leadership and collaboration within the JO in a very specific way, where no one person or institution can manifest an outcome that we're, we're searching for. Um, our leaders modelling collaboration is essential because only together will we get uh, those outcomes. And I want to recognise the, the individual um, commitment of the mayors in this regard. Um, I'd also really like to uh, recognise the commitment of our partner organisations in this regard as well. I mentioned at the dinner last night that um, their role in this has been both very practical in assisting and organising the event, but also highly symbolic uh, and importantly symbolic. So a um, uh, big thank you to uh, Newcastle Airport, to the University of Newcastle, Business Hunter and the Committee for the Hunter. <laughs> Put that over there. <laughs> All right. Um, also, a very warm welcome uh, this morning to uh, some other elected representatives. Uh, we're going to hear from Taylor Martin uh, shortly, Parliamentary Secretary for the Hunter, representing the New South Wales Premier, and also uh, Yasmin Catley, member for Swansea, uh, who's in the room. Um, yesterday, we focused on moving people and promoting globally connected enterprise. And if you'll indulge me, I did spend some time trying to distill down many hours of, of um, fantastic content um, into uh, something that uh, yeah, we can, we can um, remind ourselves of, of what we uh, did yesterday and, and launching pad for today. So uh, initially we heard from uh, Auntie Teresa Dargan who did the Welcome to Country and uh, she really reflected on how gathering is uh, an essential part of Indigenous culture when there are things to talk about. Uh, and uh, that set a great platform for the balance of the day. Uh, we heard from Sue Moore, um, Chair of the JO and Mayor of Singleton. She really reminded us uh, around mayors as leaders of independent communities, um, and they all have a role with their indi independent communities, and then the importance of them coming together to look at regional outcomes. So the role of collaboration, the role of co-defining problems, the role of co-defining solutions, and having a regional mindset um, and that was a, a great connection to what we heard later in the day of the importance of a whole region starting to have a global mindset. Um, it also, I reflected uh, listening to Sue on the way the mayors have come together and said, when we distill up all the community priorities uh, that have come out of those individual uh, councils, the things that the mayors took out as uh, strategic themes were jobs and a growing economy and connectivity, connecting to markets globally and connecting with each other uh, within, uh, within the region as, as uh, the sort of highest priority strategic themes. And uh, that was, again, great uh, fertile ground for the balance of the day. We heard from uh, Peter Cox, CEO of, of Newcastle Airport. Uh, Peter really set the scene beautifully. Uh, he, he described what the new capability is um, and, and also gave a lot of just great data about how people in this region and our sort of surrounding regions are already moving globally. So there's a very real opportunity here for an airline to come in with a ready-made um, uh, market. He talked a lot about the size and scale of the opportunity. He, he, he compared um, international visitors into distinct markets like uh, Tasmania, like the Gold Coast, and really showed how much opportunity we have. Uh, and uh, that 
made me think about, okay, this stuff takes time and energy. You've got to get started uh, now. Uh, and it's and, and also we heard a little bit later from uh, from Ollie Lamb about the importance of the uh, of the alignment um, of of all players and really people leaning into the into the region. Uh, Peter also reminded us that the two key things to unlock this opportunity for all of us in terms of jobs, in terms of uh, quality of uh, life for the region, were a terminal and landing that first uh, uh, international airline. Uh, we heard from Ollie Lamb, um, uh, Managing Director of Avalon Pacific Aviation Consulting. Um, he really took us through what airlines are looking for and reminded us to lean into the unique offering uh, that is in the Hunter. That was in a, a slightly different way, very similar to what Jeff Roberts talked uh, about. He talked about how the, the Greater Cities Commission, as it will become, uh, can be an enabler, that we can leverage their experience uh, in, in different, uh, different uh, cities, and that they see the importance of creating a regionally distinct offering. Uh, Steve Mahoney from Destination New South Wales talked us through the importance of an authentic and unique experience, and again, gave us a sense of where the synergies were in what is happening in the sort of the central uh, promotion machine within Destination New South Wales and how their um, marketing approach around the collision of different experiences and the, the importance of connection to uh, Indigenous culture are two key things that, that they're really are pushing out. And it was sort of immediately apparent to a number of people in the room how common that is with what we have uh, in, the, uh, in the Hunter. And then we, had an, we just had a fantastic panel session with Peter Cock, Elizabeth Mildwater, and Andrew Smith um, uh, uh, from the Warramai. And there was too much in that session uh, to, to uh, really um, uh, summarise it. I, I, my best effort was that the journey to global connection starts with connection to place. Um, uh, it's being offered to us in that sense. It's all our place. And that was the, one of the messages I really felt, very inclusive message from, from Andrew. Um, it, it, it's all our place, therefore it's all our responsibility. Uh, and that was a great launching pad for the workshops where we sat down and we started to say, all right, what do we all think success looks like? Um, what are the immediate actions we need to take? Uh, who are the key players? Um, and uh, later in the evening, we went to uh, dinner. Uh, it was a, a really wonderful evening. We had Ryan uh, Palmer, uh, Mayor of Port Stephens, and uh, the Deputy Mayor of City of Newcastle, uh, Declan Clawson. Um, both those councils are co-owners of the airport, uh, a demonstrable experience of, of uh, local government and place-based leadership working together. Um, and Ryan also said, um, quote unquote, um, if uh, anyone thinks the hunter's always aligned, that's bullshit, you know. Um, uh, uh, but um, that's the reality of collaboration. So it's not about everyone starting from the same point. It is about coming together and saying, what's the vision? Do we have an alignment on the vision? What are the problems? You know, do we agree what the problems are in achieving that? How do we co-design uh, solutions? Uh, and then we heard from Stephen Kukoulos, who gave us the one -on -one, 101 on global and international economics, uh, and really the importance of infrastructure and the unique opportunity, therefore, that the, the airport presents to the region. So today, uh, we're going to switch gears a little bit and shift our focus to freight and trade. Um, it's been estimated that the upgraded airport will deliver a $6.5 billion boost in gross regional product through opportunities in freight. So as freight export is diverted from Sydney and Brisbane International Airports as a result of the Cody upgrade, there's potential for Newcastle Airport to export more than 20,000 tonnes of freight worth at least $2.1 billion. So, Drawing on some of the great work done by Investment New South Wales, uh, the, the, it's been identified that international destinations for agribusiness in the Hunter region uh, include a focus on China, Japan, Korea, Vietnam, the United Arab Emirates and the Middle East and the United Kingdom. And uh, over and above agribusiness, Mor a Morrison Low report uh, that we uh, looked at uh, says that international air freight demand suggested the region's manufacturing sector will gain the most uh, benefit from a code E upgrade with estimates of a, a total output increase to uh, $280 million over the next 20 years. As I was reading my notes this morning, I sort of reflected on that's a bit of a, you, know, you have these yeah, point forecasts um, and uh, you, you really think, well, who knows this? And it reminded me of the story that Stephen Kukoulos told us last night um, about sort of known opportunity um, and unrealised opportunity. He didn't use those words, so I'm just, I'm, I'm sort of uh, thinking about that story about the Harbour Bridge, where if 
if you built the Harbour Bridge based on known opportunity, it never would have been built. There were 30,000 cars in New South Wales at that time. And that made me reflect on the importance of vision and leadership in this exercise. Um, so we're going to unpack this further today. Uh, we're going to learn more about the support for the region from the New South Wales government on maximising the opportunities in freight and trade. Uh, and also, we want to have a better understanding of what we need to do within our sectors here to maximise uh, 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 freight and trade. Um, before I hand over to our first speaker, a few housekeeping matters. Uh, we will be in this room for the plenary sessions uh, for the summit today. Uh, morning tea and lunch will be served in the Cummings room. Uh, many of you have uh, managed to grab a cup of coffee from there this morning. Uh, we've got a couple of changes to the program today. Um, we're going to have the two workshops being condensed into two groups in this room um, and we had a lot of content uh, yesterday and we thought, okay, let's, um, uh, let's take the group today and check in what we've been uh, hearing. Um, so we'll have a, a, an above the wing and a below the wing uh, session in this room uh, to finish, uh, finish off the day and we're going to move lunch forward to 12, uh, 12.30 so we'll give you all a bit of an early mark. If you are on social media, please use uh, the Hunter, uh, hashtag Hunter Global in your posts. And I'll just remind you there's a QR code at the front uh, registration desk, which is an opportunity for you reflecting on this event, the role of, of a place-based leadership to say, hey, this is what we think um, uh, place-based leaders and the Hunter Joint Organisation should be prioritising. Great feedback for us um, uh, to, to reflect on. Uh, I'd also like to uh, thank our sponsor for uh, today, which is uh, Avistra uh, Aviation Consulting, and we will uh, hear from um, their managing director, Sarah Hales, uh, a little bit um, uh, later. Uh, so thank you, uh, Sarah and Avistra, for your support today. Um, and now I'd like to introduce our first speaker, the Honourable Taylor Martin, Parliamentary Secretary for the Hunter, who's going to be speaking on behalf of the New South Wales Premier today. Please make Taylor welcome. Thank you, Joe. Um, good morning, everyone. It's a real pleasure to be here today, um, especially after the last two years that we've all endured, and it's so good to be here, look around the room and see so many familiar faces that really uh, I've seen on Zoom the last two years. Um, as my colleague here today, Yasmin Catley, MP, Member for Swansea and Shadow Minister for the Hunter, a great advocate for the Hunter inside and outside of Parliament. Um, on behalf of the New South Wales Premier, the Honourable Dominic Perrottet, MP, um, I want to thank you for your time here today and for your engagement in this process. It's very important, as we all know. Uh, he's asked me to pass on his best wishes for the event and for the two days, the day you've had, and also today. Um, the Premier and I had a discussion just on the Tuesday gone about the hunter and the issues facing the hunter. I'm very pleased that as Premier, he brings the experience he has uh, from his time as treasurer and the many visits he had here, um, some that went below the radar. We had meetings at the university and a few other stakeholders through his time as treasurer. Um, it's a great opportunity here today after the last two years we've endured uh, to speak on behalf of the New South Wales government. Uh, it's such an important part of our state and for the future of New South Wales, the vision that our government has for the wider state. Uh, I want to commend the work of the Hunter Joint Organisation and for the preparation that's gone into this event and thank Joe James and his team. Uh, all of us here in the room today have the common goal of wanting to make the Hunter a better place to live and work, uh, a better place to invest and do business uh, and just as important and increasingly important, a better place to visit. Uh, over the past two decades, uh, this city has transformed from Steel City to smart city. Uh, similarly, for the wider hunter, when outsiders think about this region, the first thought is probably about coal. Uh, behind us is the largest coal terminal in the world. Now, that view is changing, and rightfully so. And it's my firm belief that over the next decade, we will finally be recognised for having a diverse economy, and to be frank, the largest, most diverse economy outside of the nation's capital cities. Uh, Yes, we are rich with resources, that's so obvious to all. 
but we are also a home to a diverse range of well-established industries. We have a thriving agriculture and equine industry, uh, the best winemakers and excellent tourism facilities. We have engineering and manufacturing, as we all know. Uh, we have the University of Newcastle, our local university, that continues to kick goals. It's growing at a rate of knots and it's reshaping the expectations that people have for a regional university. Uh, it educates both both local and international students. Uh, and finally, um, in addition to having the world's largest coal terminal here in Newcastle, we all also have uh, the New South Wales's largest regional airport, Newcastle Airport, of which I understand was talked about quite a bit yesterday. Uh, it's the gateway to our region here, the wider Hunter, uh, and it is a key focus of this summit, rightfully so. And Newcastle is set to become even more connected to the rest of the state the nation and the world more than ever before over the next decade. This is the perfect time to focus on how we can maximise the opportunities that the runway upgrade is going to create. And although the challenges of the upheaval of the last two years of the pandemic have significantly tested our communities, they all have also given us a once in a lifetime opportunity to reimagine and create the future that we want uh, to maximise our potential here. So the New South Wales government is going to continue to be a partner in that, working with you all to take this region to the next level. Uh, and those benefits are going to flow north, up the mid-north coast and beyond, uh, west, uh, past the Hunter, uh, and south through to the central coast as well. Now, recently, the Premier outlined his bold vision for our state going forward. Uh, at its heart is the Greater Cities Plan that will connect Wollongong, uh, Newcastle, the central coast, uh, in with the Eastern Harbour, Central River and Western Parkland cities of Sydney. Uh, this six city strategy will create a mega network that connects our major airports and seaports, uh, east to west, north to south, uh, accelerating the success and prosperity of the wider macro region uh, inside and outside of Greater Sydney. Uh, this six cities vision will accelerate the next stage of our economic evolution here in New South Wales creating a state that is more open to the world than ever before uh, and ready to take on the challenges uh, that will be created around the world over the coming decades. Uh, our city and our region is going to be a key part for New South Wales in that plan. More trade opportunities, more job opportunities, more affordable homes and the better lifestyles that go with it. That's the vision. World-class education, world-class services, all within the reach of the urban hub that we have here. Now, the key is to make sure that the prosperity is long-term and sustainable, uh, that it's grown properly so that it's here for the long-term. Uh, a genuine investment into the well-being of people now and for generations to come. Now, coal has been an important part of our economy here in the Hunter, literally for centuries, for longer than New South Wales has uh, even had a parliament. Uh, it was one of the colony's first export industries and it, it will continue to be an important industry for the hunter for the foreseeable few decades ahead. However, the region will be affected by the global transition to low carbon forms of energy generation. As we all know, we are already planning uh, to ensure the sustainability of the hunter's economy into the future and provide the much needed security for coal dependent communities. Uh, this work is well underway and our first test is here right now as we all know with yesterday's announcement uh, of origin origins announcement rather of a raring closing earlier than otherwise planned our vision for this region is built on a strong record of investment in new jobs new industries uh, the industries of the future the hunter is set to become a booming new center for decarbonized energy the Hunter Central Coast Renewable Energy Zone that we legislated in 2020 is set to ensure this region remains our state's energy powerhouse well into the future, with a planned shift away from traditional energy sources to the clean energy that the world increasingly wants as they replace the coal that they purchase from us with whatever may come next. Registrations of interest in the Renewable Energy Zone already, in, uh, already exceeds $100 billion in commercial investment. Uh, that includes 24 solar projects, 13 onshore and seven offshore energy projects, 35 large scale batteries and eight pumped hydro projects proposed. 
these renewable energy generation and storage projects have the potential to deliver more than 100,000 gigawatt hours of renewable clean energy a year. Uh, it means more jobs, uh, safer jobs for the future, uh, investment and prosperity for this region now and well into the future as we make that transition. The renewable energy zone will not only attract investment in zero carbon electricity, but it will also underpin the growth of new carbon, uh, low carbon in industries, such as hydrogen, ammonia, uh, and metal production of all different kinds, which the world is going to increasingly demand as it decarbonizes. The Hunter Central Coast Renewable Zone is a complex long-term project, uh, but we are anticipating that it will be better down and formally declared by the middle of this year. <clears throat> uh, as a region, we are also scaling up our role in the hydrogen economy. Off the back of our government's $70 million commitment into hydrogen hubs, uh, one of which will be here in the Hunter. In 2020, when I was chair of the Parliament's State Development Committee, I established an inquiry into the potential for a New South Wales hydrogen industry. The release of a statewide strategy was one of many outcomes that I was aiming for, and I was pleased to see that release last year. It's the first of many, many steps that will need to be taken to have a thriving hydrogen industry across New South Wales, but particularly here in the Hunter. Uh, this strategy provides, <coughs> excuse me, provides up to $3 billion of incentives to commercialise hydrogen supply chains, reduce the cost of green hydrogen, lift production to 100,000 tonnes per annum, uh, and create 10,000 jobs by 2030. Of course, the Hunter is an obvious location for the development of a large-scale hydrogen industry uh, due to our access to significant uh, existing energy infrastructure, the sustainable water sources, uh, and a highly skilled workforce in the engineering and electricity space. Uh, also, we have existing hydrogen production capabilities, although they'll have to be ramped up enormously, of course, and that's the whole point of the investment. Uh, the ports and the logistics capabilities are right here and are getting ready for that future supply of cheap, reliable, clean energy that the world wants us to begin to export to them. We have no time to waste in this hydrogen space. Countries around the world have set ambitious targets for hydrogen production and use, uh, particularly our existing trading partners. Uh, over the next decade, competition for market share will increase. Supply chains will be established that will benefit first movers in the medium and long term greatly. Uh, the Hunter Hydrogen Hub will grow and diversify the local economy, create new and future focused jobs. Uh, and if we harness the power of hydrogen, the Hunter can retain our position as an energy superpower as we have been for such a long time. It will help countries in our region and beyond to reach their, de uh, their decarbonisation targets. Uh, and at the same time, it will secure the prosperity of our region for the next two centuries, as coal has done here for the previous two centuries. The New South Wales Government is also committed to supporting the Hunter through the Regional Growth Fund. Uh, since, it, since its creation in 2017, the Regional Growth Fund has invested nearly $30 million in projects throughout the Hunter. Uh, there have been some $58 million in restart funding allocated to Hunter councils and organisations for in infrastructure building, uh, renewal and upgrade. Uh, this funding, which many of you will be well and truly familiar with, has uh, upgraded parks, recreation facilities, cycleways, cultural facilities, and tourism opportunities that we all use uh, and that we hope, of course, um, uh, people who come from overseas and interstate uh, will use into the future as they recognise the Hunter as a tourism hub. Finally, the Williamtown Special Activation Precinct is on track to be Australia's leading national and international defence, aeronautics and aerospace hub. Williamtown has long been a defence hub, as we all know. It will continue to be uh, as host of a maintenance and sustainment hub for the F-35 uh, fighter fleet. Uh, special activation pr precincts like the one in Williamtown uh, bring together planning and investment funding uh, to create jobs and boost economic growth in dedicated regions around New South Wales. Uh, and it's a key part of the New South Wales government's plan for these regional areas. The precincts strengthen the region's economy by attracting investors uh, and making it easier for new and existing businesses to establish and expand in those areas. 
businesses that set up in a precinct will be supported by a concierge service and benefit from st st streamlined planning processes, government funded infrastructure uh, and a coordinated approach to addressing land use issues. Uh, special activation precincts will ensure regional New South Wales is well placed to grow and meet future economic needs for generations to come. I'm particularly glad that Williamtown is one of the first few across the state uh, to have that special activation precinct designation. Uh, the Williamtown SAP capitalises on the existing aerospace industry around Newcastle Airport uh, and the Williamtown RAF base by establishing the area as a national and international hub that supports defence and aerospace. The precinct is going to attract exciting future-focused industries that are expected to create more than 4,300 jobs here in the Hunter. As part of the SAP, the New South Wales Government will continue to consider how best to support the terminal upgrade for the Newcastle Airport, uh, as it is the key, the gateway to our area from people outside. Uh, work is continuing to refine the area of the Williamtown precinct uh, for the SAP purposes and the draft master plan is due to go on public exhibition very soon. Uh, we will invite the community and stakeholders to view those plans, provide feedback and help to shape the final master plan for the Williamtown project uh, in due time. Funding for the precinct is on top of the nearly $12 million that the New South Wales Government has committed to the Astra Aero Lab, a defence, aerospace and innovation precinct, uh, which we're proud to be partnering with Newcastle Airport to deliver. Both of these projects will provide long-term, high-paying, high-skilled career opportunities for residents, uh, especially giving local students job opportunities in the Hunter once, the, once they finish their studies. Uh, once again, I'd like to thank all of you for your time here yesterday and today. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak more uh, and outlining some of the New South Wales Government's initiatives. Uh, it's not an exhaustive list, list but it's uh, what we had time for this morning. Uh, as the Hunter's Parliamentary Secretary in the New South Wales Government, uh, I know that New South Wales will only be successful if the Hunter is successful going forward, and I am extremely optimistic of that. I look forward to meeting and chatting with you all uh, in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Taylor. That was excellent. Um, can't understate the importance of having a common a common goal and a common vision uh, when we're talking about collaboration. It, it's like an essential starting point. So it was great to hear uh, around the the, the recognition uh, from state government around the importance of growth and diversification of the region, uh, the role of the hunter in serving markets to our north, west, and south. Um, the, the recognition of the impacts of changing uh, energy technologies on, on the region, but then the, the fantastic opportunities, um, the what I call the alluring opportunity of hydrogen, huge, strategic, super complex, um, uh, but, um, but one that the state government is really demonstrating a lot of leadership in. And, uh, and then the more near-term near opportunities of, of the Williamtown uh, SAP doesn't, it's not lost on me that all of those things um, are only going to be amplified or accelerated uh, through having a fantastic airport capability. Um, and it also uh, just reminded me that um, there's a little Waratah in the bottom of our partner section, which I haven't been mentioning and just by pure oversight. Um, the Hunter JO uh, doesn't get any direct funding from the state government, but a lot of the grant opportunities that state government offers um, are things that we then take up and seek to to use to catalyse collaboration. And uh, in part, um, there was a, a grant opportunity that we used to help fund this event, which is why we recognise the the state government uh, in that in that context. And so, uh, important to to recognise the um, implicit and necessary uh, and you know, sort of the, the, the sine qua non, you can't do it without collaboration and we couldn't do even this event without the support of state government. So I wanna recognise that. Um, our next speaker is Amy Brown. Her extensive portfolio of responsibilities um, or among her extensive portfolio, she's the CEO of Investment New South Wales, which is the central government agency with a mandate to promote New South Wales to the world as a place to invest, study and to do business. Uh, and um, for, for most of us, we will interact with various functions, even we don't often realise they're from Investment New South Wales, but um, uh, there's, uh, there's a lot of activity that's happening in the Hunter uh, through Investment New South Wales. Uh, this year, she was appointed Secretary for the New South Wales Department of Enterprise, Investment and Trade, 
We're very fortunate to have Amy with us today to speak about the opportunities for the hunters export and trade. Please join me in welcoming Amy. Good morning, everyone, and thank you so much, Joe, for the introduction. Uh, and it was also uh, great to have the kind of scene set by the Parliamentary Secretary for the Hunter. Um, so it's really great to be able to build on that. I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land where we're meeting today, uh, the Awabakal people and Waramai peoples, and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging, and I extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here today. So. I'm pleased to be with you in the beautiful Hunter region. A little bit of me wants to move here. I was always texting my husband going, investment property? Um, not that we can. Um, but it's absolutely beautiful and it's really great to see the kind of, you know, um, rebirth and renaissance and all this good stuff happening up here. Um, and it's an absolute joy to be a part of it, uh, particularly on this conference. So um, I'm talking about the opportunities um, for the hunters export and trade. And of course, the ways that New South Wales government is accelerating our state's economic growth and how that applies specifically to the hunter. And they're telling me to move the slides. Um, oh no, not yet. I'm on that one still. Um, so thank you to the Hunter Joint Organisation for the invitation to be part of this very important summit. Now, I've always said that the role of government is to make something happen that otherwise would not have happened, sidebar, or stop things from happening that shouldn't. Um, and so when we're going to be having a conversation on the panel later, I really want to draw out and kind of take that into more of an informal realm. Um, I'll be talking about government's role in kind of, you know, being to enable, uh, connect, uh, invest in power, and sometimes just get out the way. But in able to be able to do that well, I wanted to use this session to kind of lay the foundations in terms of a bunch of programs and initiatives that government uh, is using to help bring the best of the world to the hunter and help bring the best of the hunter to the world. So, um, and as I said, it was great to have the Honourable Taylor Martin uh, kind of set that some of the scene there. So I'll build on some of that. Um, but first, what is Investment New South Wales? Why do we exist? So our job we were set up on the 29th of March uh, 2021, so we're nearly a year old. And uh, the idea behind it is that we bring together the right people, the right projects and support from across government, so you don't have to knock on 2,600 doors, um, to get so that we can help you. Uh, and we can uh, work with the private sector to maximise economic benefit, jobs growth and prosperity. Now, even more recently, I have two jobs, um, we've created the Department of Enterprise Investment and Trade, um, DEET, sometimes people say DEET because I think they want to do just DEET, but anyway, um, I'm going with DEET, and it's at the heart of uh, New South Wales government's commitment to economic development, embracing science, innovation, and emerging technology. Uh, and I'll explain a bit more about that later, but uh, I'm honored to have been appointed secretary of that department 18 days ago now, so I'm still a newborn. Um, but along with my continuing role as CEO of Investment New South Wales, this cluster gives us the capacity to drive our state's long-term economic development and transformation. And a essential part of that is ensuring that New South Wales, including this region, is the most attractive place in the world to visit and live. So one can't succeed without the other. I can't attract global investment here unless it's livable and connected and fun um, and vibrant. But um, attracting global investment here only adds to that story. So they're very much kind of symbiotic. And the Hunter region is a fantastic example of both growth and liv livability and with the international connections that will come from Newcastle's expanded airport, businesses here are certainly ready for takeoff. I'm cringing a bit at the pun. I wonder if I'm the first one to have made it on this conference or not. Um, but absolutely legitimately, legitimately, since 2011, this state has done so much investment in infrastructure, which is amazing and very much needed to make sure that people can get to, you know, services and work and each other um, and, uh, you know, and education and all of those things. But we need to make sure that for each region where that investment's been made, it gets maximised, maximised for the most economic benefit possible and the most jobs for your citizens. 
So I'm just going to focus on the programs and services that Investment New South Wales is providing uh, for SMEs and our work here in the Hunter. And we're very, very proud to already be supporting so many businesses across the wine sector, sector agribusiness, manufacturing, clean energy and defence and aerospace. And I'm sure you won't be shy to tell me what else you think we should be doing. So. Uh, Morning tea will be interesting. Right, why New South Wales? So in the wake of the challenges of the last two years, of course the pandemic, geopolitical changes, complexity everywhere, um, let's take that complexity and make it a once in a generation opportunity for New South Wales to play and extend and transform our economic reach. For those of you who were at dinner last night, Stephen Kokoulis spelled it out um, in very, I mean, if he was my university lecturer, um, I would have listened a whole lot more, uh, just kidding. I was actually really nerdy <laughs> at uni. Um, but it was just so clear to me as to where our state is currently sitting on the global scale, um, what's kind of happening uh, in terms of, um, you know, our, fi our financial stability, our economic opportunities. So let's go there and kind of make it happen. So New South Wales is actually already an economic powerhouse. I don't know if you know this, but there's only one year in recorded history where our economy hasn't grown. Uh, we're connected globally and have strong links across the world's fastest growing region, the Indo-Pacific. We have world-class education and research institutions. Um, if New South Wales were a country, it would rank fourth in the world for workers with tertiary qualifications at 48%. We're pretty clever. Um, and we have a highly skilled and diverse workforce. We're so multicultural. Over 30% of us speak a second language at home. Um, we have a, uh, we're entrepreneurial. Half of all startup founders in Australia are based in New South Wales. Um, and I was talking to some of the, you know, startup founders like Airtree and Blackbird, about a billion dollars a month is pouring into our economy uh, in venture capital. And new um, Australia has more unicorns, private companies valued at over a billion dollars. Um, the, the market capitalization, sorry, of Australian unicorns is more than Israeli unicorns. And the same can be said of kind of some, you know, as capital cities such as Sydney and Tel Aviv. So we are so entrepreneurial. Um, we're in such a great space, we have to build on it. So it's that foundation that New South Wales government gets to swoop in um, and bring a strong suite of policies and programs to make it all happen. Uh, but obviously, we can't have it can't happen alone. It's the triple helix between uh, industry, government and uh, universities that really brings that innovation uh, and global expansion toward jobs of the future. So Australia's largest regional economy, um, the hunter has a huge part to play. So what does our agency do? Uh, so nearly 12 months under our belt, and um, that's long time in government, you know, I'm expected to have delivered some stuff by now. So we've proven already to be pretty effective at attracting investment to New South Wales, assisting New South Wales businesses to scale up and go global. I think that's one of our strongest points from all the observations that I've made, and driving those collaborative partnerships between government and non-government. We bring the agency brings together a bunch of economic development and investment attraction activities that was already happening in government, but in lots and lots of different places. So it was a really big consolidation um, of all of that kind of economic development again, so that we can be the front door and offer one point of accountability for the private sector to help drive local and international investment and generate jobs for our state. So um, the kind of broad focus, industry development, investment attraction, research and development cannot be underestimated, trade, tourism and major events. Um, and my little slogan is we're about making opportunities happen. We create the links and strengthen the bonds between government, business, industry and academia. And the whole goal of this, not just for its own sake, is to maximise economic benefit jobs growth and prosperity for the people of New South Wales, which to me means is code for better quality of life. So it's pretty exciting. On a personal level, I'm very passionate about working with my team across New South Wales and internationally. I love being a New South Wales public servant. Um, and I often have people come up to these things and go, oh, it sounds so good, can I have a job? So um, I'm always on a recruitment drive. Uh, but Genuinely, work, I mean, I've had a long career in the private sector as well, but when you work for government, and a lot of you in this room know this, you can really see those actual tangible difference in the, in, the, in the lives of citizens. And, you know, being able to deliver outcomes that do improve quality of life, access to opportunities and provide value. So my personal kind of values mission for a long time has been to enable access to opportunity for all people of New South Wales so that together we can create an even better state 
state. So this job's perfect because it aligns with my values. Right, so here's some of our stuff. Um, we've hit the ground running to be able to put um, a string of major initiatives in place. Uh, we published New South Wales's first ever trade statement and said we're going to double the value of New South Wales exports from 96 billion to 200 billion by 2031. Uh, we did an innovation partnership with the CSIRO to drive digital technology manufacturing and health excellence across New South Wales based innovation precincts. We're delivering an entrepreneurship and innovation ecosystem action plan with $20 million in new funding for precinct development. I hear you saying, when's the next iteration of that for this city? Yep, heard it. Um, and our Office of New South Wales Chief Scientist is coordinating the delivery of $24 million Small Business Innovation Research Program, uh, which is where we put kind of problems out to market and the market comes up with solutions and we co-fund them and get involved and, and solve those kind of, some of those tricky issues. Um, like I said, we make opportunities happen. We're proactive. So we don't just sit back um, like uh, one of the kind of issues I almost have with one stop shop is it makes it sound like you're just waiting for everyone to come to you. No, we actually focus on areas of the economy where large fast change will happen, where New South Wales and this region have natural underlying strengths that can be leveraged. We've done a lot of research on that um, so that we can actually um, provide the best opportunities for people uh, by by leveraging them and um, creating that economic benefit for New South Wales. And it's also about sustainable future orientated jobs. Some of these jobs we don't even know exist yet. Um, so it's setting up the future for our kids and our grandkids and all that good stuff. Now we're a global company, um, my first ever global role, um, because we, we're actually rolling out 21 offices around the world in a hub and spoke model in key regions, where New South Wales should be strategically based. This actually is part of the implementation of the global New South Wales strategy. Um, and all of this network is key to supporting aspiring and existing exporters, uh, such as those in the Hunter, to access new markets and customers. So we are, you know, in the very short space of time, we're going to have 55 people across six key hubs and then the kind of spoke offices around the world. Two of our senior trade investment commissioners might already be familiar to you because they've definitely been pounding the pavement in the Hunter um, to set themselves up with the knowledge and relationships that's necessary for when they get overseas to be able to represent you well. Um, Stephen Cartwright's our UK Agent General and Senior Trade Investment Commissioner for Europe and Israel. Mike Newman has been appointed Senior Trade Investment Commissioner, I'm just going to say stick, it's quicker, um, for North Asia in our Tokyo office and already fostering opportunities for New South Wales, healthcare, food and agricultural produce. They've been busy touring the Hunter, meeting with different business groups. Uh, most recently, they're really focusing on the energy and aerospace sectors, no surprise there, to gauge how they can best represent you. Uh, Andrew Parker is our stick designate in Singapore uh, and one of his priorities importantly is to ensure the return of international students to our world-class educational institutions um, tertiary education being one of our top exports and Vish Vishwesh uh, I do this every time Padmanaban yes um, will represent our interests as stick in India in the Middle East and our newly expanded global network is helping New South Wales businesses in the Hunter and across the state to be able to scale up internationally. It's all about scaling and go global. So it means New South Wales businesses, well, we literally have people working around the clock for you. So um, that's always a good thing. Uh, these are our proactive sectors. We've done so much economic analysis um, and industry consultation to make sure we get these right. That was my first job um, when I arrived at the agency. Uh, so. Basically, there are th these are the areas where New South Wales has the potential for real transformation, where government involvement uh, is helpful, if you understand what I mean. So it includes things like medicine and visitor economy and agriculture. They already provide significant employment in the Hunter region, but will continue to have huge growth potential. But then we also have areas where we're technological strong. Once you start to overlay technologies, it becomes really interesting. So clean tech and digital technology, and then these emerging sectors such as med tech and aerospace, where there's great momentum, the John Hunter Health and Innovation Precinct, Williamtown Special Activation Precincts. Special activation precincts really do play that kind of enablement role for government. Uh, everyone connects with the Hunter, connects the Hunter 
Malta already, of course, with great wines. Um, when I was first up here, I think it was last April, uh, we signed a three-year MOU uh, between New South Wales government and the wine industry so that we can proactively support and continue. Um, as you probably know, grape and wine production uh, contributes $1.6 billion per annum to the New South Wales economy and has lots of flow on economic benefits. Um, but, and it not only uh, it provides economic opportunities, it enhances livability, especially after a long day at work. Um, so these are not the only industries we're working on, but in terms of, you know, I want to use my people for highest and best use, I say focus on that and get out there. Um, so hopefully they're doing that. And if you don't see them, let me know. Um, it means they're hiding. So uh, this is so important for us. We know this. So this is about, you know, transitioning from traditional energy sources to renewable energy sources. There is trillions of dollars of global investment looking for a home and it's going to land somewhere. So how do we make sure that it lands here in this region as much as possible in this region in the Hunter? So net zero is a top priority for investment in New South Wales. I've appointed a head of net zero economy uh, who has a lot of experience from the private sectors come in, helping us to just kind of change our thinking a little bit, get more innovative and engage with you. Uh, as I'm sure you know, New South Wales government has targets to halve our carbon emissions by 2030 and reach net zero by 2050, backed by really is nation leading policies for renewable energy, electric vehicles and green hydrogen uh, and treasurer Keen is doing a fantastic job in this space. So basically we want New South Wales to lead the world uh, when it comes to capturing the jobs and investment generated by this global transition to net zero and, and also supporting existing industries and businesses as they seek to decarbonise. So we've got a dual role when it comes to net zero. We've identified identified green hydrogen, no surprises, critical minerals and resources, key areas of focus for us where there's a lot happening in this space and where New South Wales can be the best. Um, one of the key actions of the hydrogen strategy, and you know this, is to develop hydrogen hubs in both the Upper Hunter and Illawarra. Illawarra. Uh, I had the pleasure of meeting Claire Sykes, head of the Hunter Hydrogen and Tech hydrogen technology cluster um, and one of our big things about investing in hydrogen hubs it's that government as investor actually putting 70 million dollars into an EOI process to award grants in the third quarter of this year and have the first green hydrogen produced by June 2024 which is not far away. Uh, AGL and Fortescue Future Industries are conducting feasibility studies to leverage the infrastructure at AGL's Liddell and Bayswater coal, coal fire power plants uh, in the Upper Hunter for large-scale green hydrogen production. Um, the proposed, uh, they will produce globally significant gigawatt scale and supply domestic and export opportunities. We've already assisted Newcastle company, New South Wales Energy Renaissance. Australia's first lithium iron battery manufacturer by helping them to identify rapidly emerging sectors, electric buses, commercial trucks, resulting in a range of industry connections and R&D opportunities. Sometimes our role is to be matchmaker. Uh, within the next few years, Energy Renaissance will employ several hundred people in the Newcastle area, create many indirect jobs nationwide um, as, their as their operations expand. Um, all of this means New South Wales is open for business and investment. Uh, as I said, we have a comprehensive range of programs. One that's kind of generic but very applicable uh, to this region is our $250 million Jobs Plus program. That incentivizes the private sector to invest in job creation opportunities. So the short story is if you, create, if you um, would like to um, uh, create a new project or expand an existing project and it creates more than 30 jobs, then come and see us because there are things on offer around payroll tax exemptions, infrastructure rebates, skills and training rebates. Uh, so we have a lot of opportunity there with $250 million and we want to create uh, 25,000 jobs. So um, it basically, yeah, and it also uh, supports international companies establish their footprint here. So an example of that is the expansion of Rex Airlines. So that generates 2,500 direct and indirect jobs, pretty good one. Uh, construction of a flight simulator and new hangar at Sydney Airport, and they're also boosting their call centre at Orange. And alongside the international airport upgrade, 
upgrades, and we'll hear a bit about this in the next se section, a strong avia domestic aviation sector will ensure people are connected right across the state and help us to capitalise on the reinvestment on the reopening of our international borders. For me, a lot of that is around, you know, of course, bringing the best of hunter to the world, but also bringing the best of the world to the hunter. Uh, that includes things like tourists, um, um, students, investors, and talent. This is going global. Uh, going global for us is very much about empowering. So um, the project help the program helps eligible New South Wales businesses to reach new customers customers in international markets. We actually have an export advisor. We have them all across the state, but we have one in the Hunter specifically. Uh, so senior export advisor Sharon Foster. She can provide one on one services and kind of you know really coach and concierge to link into the expertise of our global network. So um, our, we tend to support businesses in food and beverages, agri food, processed food health and med tech, technology manufacturing, cybersecurity, fintech, edtech and space, it's kind of everything. Um, and we're currently working with nearly a dozen hunter-based businesses to make sure that they uh, are ready to go. Uh, that includes uh, Rodacaster, uh, I hope I said that right, um, a Beresfield business that's going global, uh, you probably know them, design, develop and manufacture uh, a unique type of multi-directional wheel. Uh, so we've really helped them with um, international med tech trade show opportunities, in language customer presentations and ongoing e-commerce support to expand global opportunities. Uh, Macca's Australian Black Angus Beef, fifth generation run business, which we've been able to connect with new markets in the UAE, Middle East, Eastern Vietnam, and they're currently shipping beef to 50 countries. And we've supported 27 hunter companies through our export assistance grants. So those grants are, um, uh, you know, uh, thousands of dollars and assist eligible businesses to recover from changes to international trading conditions due to COVID bushfires and drought. So, oh, it's there's thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, Investment New South Wales exists to create connections for growth and our teams are ready, willing and able um, to help hunter businesses, especially maximising the opportunities as a result of the new Newcastle International Airport. Um, it'll make it even, even easier for us to take, as I say, the best of you to the world. Um, this has always been a region of rich natural resources underpinned by the world's best quality coal. But now as we see an expansion toward clean economy, advanced manufacturing, international education, agribusiness, defence and aerospace. We're going to use your natural resources of the region and resourcefulness and innovation, Newcastle, world's smartest city, um, into the economic future. So my team and I look forward to uh, working with you in the coming months and I look forward to being accosted at morning tea. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Amy. What a job. Uh, and um, I don't know where you get your energy, but um, can I have some of that, please? That'd be, that'd be great. Um, and thank you, thank you for bringing it uh, this morning. It was great to hear uh, about the role of investment in New South Wales in maximising outcomes, uh, particularly around jobs and that lead into sort of quality of life and the, uh, the really strong and apparent emphasis on going global. Um, is obviously going to make Investment New South Wales a critical partner for, for the region. Uh, and, um, and you talked about driving large, fast change. We want that. Uh, so, so that was a, a, a really great message uh, to, to deliver for this room. Um, can I remind everyone before we move on to the next section, uh, when we have the panel later, there's a Slido uh, to put your questions up. So use the uh, go to slido.com and use the uh, code Friday panel uh, to to uh, capture your questions. So um, reflect on what Amy's uh, just said, start to put some questions in uh, and also do the same as you're listening to our next speaker. Our next speaker is Sarah Hales, the Managing Director of Avistra Aviation Consulting. Sarah is an expert in the aviation sector with more than two decades of commercial experience across infrastructure, logistics and aviation. With Toowoomba Wellcamp Airport, she led the commercial functions through the construction and early operational phases, supporting the airport's rapid growth and diversification. As general manager, Sarah was responsible for both the commercial and operational management of the airport. 
I know she's going to help us get uh, really practical um, around um, what we need to be doing here and what we need to be thinking about. Uh, she's going to help us demystify the complex world of freight. So please help me welcome Sarah. Thanks, Joe, and good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Let me work out the tech. Press that button, I guess. It's not very complex, is it? So thanks for having me today. And I haven't been to Newcastle since I was a very little girl, where we had our family holidays somewhere on Port Stephens, which I thought was called Piggy's Beach. And I think I've lived this lie, because I talked to a taxi driver on the way from the airport, and I said, oh, yeah, we used to come here every year, and we went to Piggy's Beach, and we went camping. He's like, where? And I said, are you new here? And he said, no, I've been here for 60 years. <laughs> so anyway, I was somewhere here. I don't know what it's really called. But yeah, we're going to get really um, into some uh, really practical stuff about how air freight works, what drives it, what does the supply chain look like, um, just because it's a bit of an unknown world. And even for people who work in aviation on the passenger side of the business, this is a whole new area. It has a different set of commercial drivers. So we're going to talk about that specifically. And I was really heartened by what Taylor said earlier about long-term and sustainable prosperity, because it's very much aligns with our views and philosophy around aviation development. None of your exporting businesses or your tourism businesses want to sink their time and energy into developing an opportunity that evaporates in six or 12 months' time after various funding from government might evaporate. We want to build something that lasts and is sustainable in the economy. And Amy, what an impressive bunch of programs. There's some awesome work happening there. And I really want to reiterate what you said about bringing the best of the world to the hunter. From an aviation business case point of view, your inbound is just as important as the outbound. And as I'll show you, from an air freight point of view, it's actually more important because it's higher yield. Yes. Sometimes I feel like I need to bring my teenagers along with me. So this is the air freight value chain. And we're just going to explain who are these different organisations and what they do. And first of all, we're going to work away from the left to the right. So this is the export value chain. The import value chain is nearly exactly the same, but in reverse. There are a few changes, but it's essentially the same set of people doing similar tasks. You have an exporter. And the exporter either delivers or arranges to have delivered. We're just talking about flow of goods at the moment. Arranges to have delivered. Uh, their cargoes to a freight forwarder. Now, a freight forwarder is like a travel agent for cargo. They book the cargo space on an airline. They'll pack the cargoes into some sort of aircraft unit load device. And the one you see there is an AKE. You would have seen those on passengers, on passenger aircraft all around airports all over the place. Very common. So the freight forwarder will handle all of the weird paperwork that has to sit around air freight from a regulatory point of view for the Australian Customs, for the Department of Agriculture and we'll have delivered to the cargo terminal the air freight. The cargo terminal, so the freight forward is working on behalf of the exporter, the cargo terminal is working mostly on behalf of the airline. And the cargo terminal will receive the cargoes and weigh them and enter them into the aircraft's manifest and also report to customs that they've arrived at the cargo terminal. And when they've been loaded on an aircraft, they'll report that as well, using the ICS or the integrated cargo system. So the cargo terminal has the cargoes all ready to go. And at some point, they enter a security controlled uh, chain as well. But that happens at different points depending upon those particular circumstances. The ground handler is the organization who picks the cargo up from the cargo terminal and delivers it to the aircraft and uses a range of equipment to load it onto the aircraft. And then, of course, you've got the airline itself. Pretty simple process. But there's a really complex flow of money through this chain. And it's important to understand because what happens, like I work in air freight development all around Australia, and what we see time and time again is a really big focus on talking to the exporters in trying to understand what is the air freight business case. And sure, they're really important. They're the, they're the customer, right? And they're the economic development you're trying to stimulate. But generally, it's not where the most market power sits in terms of where does the uh, air freight industry use, which, you know, which air service is going to be successful, which airport is going to receive the cargoes. So flow of money, exporter pays the freight forwarder. He's pay the exporter is paying the freight forwarder for a range of services, but pretty much just to solve the logistics problem for them, to navigate all of the challenging government paperwork, particularly for prescribed goods, which is all of your foods and things like that. The freight forwarder pays both the cargo terminal 
for some of the cargo terminal services, but not all of them, and the airline for the airspace. So the freight forwarder is like an agent selling the, um, selling the space on the airline on their behalf. But interestingly, the airline also pays the freight forwarder. They get a kickback, they get a commission on what they sell to the airline. So it's a really important um, part of that scenario to understand how the freight forwarder is getting paid. And also that the freight forwarder, does this have a pointer? No? The freight forwarder might also have purchased a large amount of space on an aircraft and then be committed to it and want to fill it up. Sometimes they'll take a risk on that and that influences their behaviour. Who else is getting paid? The airline pays the cargo terminal for the work they do on their behalf and also pays the ground handler as well. Who pays the airport? Well, pretty much everyone. Well done, airport. Um, the freight forwarder will pay the airport if they have premises on site at the airport. And many airports will have an extensive property plan. It's an important part of their revenue scenario to, to sell, to not so much sell, but more lease premises to organisations like freight forwarders. Cargo terminals will nearly always be on airport. There's a small number of them that are off airport at, around some of the larger airports, but generally they're always on airport. Ground handlers require leasing space for the storage of their equipment and for the offices that they have on the, on the um, airport as well. And of course, the airline pays a landing fee. So when you look at it together, four of those are paying the airport, and that's how the money flows through the air freight value chain, generally speaking. Of course, there are exceptions to this, but this is generally how it works. And if you think about the number of organisations that each of these uh, little steps represents, you can start to understand the incredible power that the freight forwarder industry has here and the importance of making sure they're properly engaged in your process as you go through um, grabbing this hold of this opportunity. So from an exporter's point of view, there's going to be hundreds of exporters or importers, hundreds of them. From an airline's point of view, operating in and out of Australia, normally what is from an international freight capability point of view, there could be 20 or more airlines. I actually haven't counted them. But from a freight forwarder's point of view, there's lots and lots of freight forwarders, but it's one of those really good examples of 80% um, of the business belonging to 20% of the people. From a freight forwarder's point of view in the perishable market, there's probably three or four major freight forwarders who control the vast majority of Australia's export air freight. So they have a lot of power. So let's have a quick look at the regulatory environment um, that goes all along here. There's three, this is not an extensive look at the regulatory environment, it's just the three big ones that are really specific to the air freight value chain. We've got the Department of Agriculture on the top line, the Australian Border Force, which is our customs service on the middle line, and on the bottom line, Department of Home Affairs and the Transport Security Regulator, who's changed their name a couple of times and I'm struggling to keep updating myself as that happens. Um, exporters who are exporting uh, prescribed goods, which is all of your food and pharmaceuticals and things like that, they'll have to have specific licensing and permissions from the Department of Agriculture. And that's designed to protect our trade relationships by making sure that Australian exporters who are sending product overseas are doing it at the right standard. Some of the requirements of these approved arrangements also speak to various trade deals and expectations around um, perhaps phytosanitary treatment for product going into another country. So many exporters, particularly if they're a prescribed goods exporter, will actually be licensed with the Department of Agriculture to do that. Freight forwarders will also have some type of approved arrangements for the handling of perishable cargoes into uh, aircraft ULDs. And cargo terminals will have it as well, but they'll have it at a lower level. So this is a really important part of your supply chain. You want to have a proper chain with good integrity from the exporter to the aircraft. And if you don't have the right licensing along that chain, you're going to have a gap and that gap is going to mean the cargoes go elsewhere in order to access a viable supply chain. When I was working at WellCamp, what we did, because we had a similar problem to you, we had no, um, no real freight forwarding community around us, we understood that that was the case. So we actually licensed our cargo terminal at the same level as a freight forwarding premises so that we could fill that gap in the supply chain. So ground handlers have to do a fair bit of biosecurity awareness, but they don't tend to have specific licensing. And the airport itself needs to have a range of permissions from the federal government around have supporting international operations. Things like being a port of first entry 
um, and being gazetted under Section 15 of the Customs Act as a place of import and export. And this gives the uh, Australian Border Force the uh, legal standing with which they can exercise their powers on airport in order to protect Australia's borders from things we don't want in Australia. Border Force has a similar range of licensing. Some exporters and importers might be trusted traders. This helps them to navigate and reduce some of the red tape with getting product in and out. It's a sign of a well-established, sophisticated and well-practiced exporting community when some of the exporters are trusted traders. You can have a look at your community. How many of your exporters are trusted traders? If there's none of them, it means they may be fairly early on their, on their journey as exporters. And it's an easy facilitation thing to help them become trusted traders in order to smooth their pathway a little bit. Border Force has a range of other licensing required for the handling of international cargoes, particularly from an inbound point of view. Again, they're managing risk, so there's a range of bonded facilities. Again, if you don't have these in your supply chain, it's going to be a problem for the actual operation of air cargo in and out. Some of these things need to be thought about now, because if you're going to have international flights by 2024, that's not that long away. And if you don't have sufficient physical infrastructure to support the licensing requirements of these things, you're going to have to build it and then move through a licensing process, which will take, well, depends, depends on how hard you push, but um, you know, they tell you it's going to take 12 months. So it, it does take a while. Let's, let's plan ahead for that. Transport security, also the whole supply chain tends to be regulated from a transport security point of view. Exporters can be non-consigners. This means that their products are, um, the, the way they do their operation inside their own premises gives some sort of certainty around the transport security of the goods. And so long as those goods are handled within a regulated transport security chain, they then don't need to be screened again. So non-consigners, again, like trusted trader, a bit of a sign of a sophisticated and established exporting community. Um, but licensing is essential from sort of freight forwarder through cargo terminal. And of course, the aircraft and airport will already have transport security licensing and a transport security program. I want to talk a little bit about aircraft operations. This is the inside of a 747-8 freighter. Um, it's actually the one at WellCamps. So this is Cathay Pacific's aircraft. Uh, and I understand from the, avi from the airport, the aviation development plan is particularly focused around narrow body aircraft into the Pacific and similar places and wide body aircraft um, across Asia and into the US or North America. Um, so, so that means that this type of aircraft isn't front and center of the ambitions here and have, not having a deep look, but having a cursory look, I think that's probably a good thing, but still interesting photos, hey? So we've got two basic aircraft types, narrow body and wide body. As a passenger, when you get on a narrow body aircraft, it has a single aisle up the middle, and seats on each side. So it's like the A320, the 737, the Q400, those are all wide, uh, narrow body aircraft. And the wide body aircraft are the ones you get on and they have two aisles. Now the, the big two aisles up the center. The big difference from an air freight point of view is that generally speaking, the narrow body fleet cannot handle aircraft unit load device containerization. Things like the AKE, that was a little picture of before. And that has implications for cold chain integrity. Uh, and it also has implications for some of the phytosecurity requirements around the, uh, so some countries require products to be sealed in their aircraft unit load device and have a little tag put on it so they can tell no one tampered with it on its way into country. So narrow body aircraft are fine for an air freight point of view, but they don't tend to carry an awful lot of um, volume and they do have some constraints around their ability with cold chain. Wide body aircraft, however, have a lot of capability. And what's really exciting for me is that your opportunity uh, with the wide body aircraft is not underpinned by the air freight business case itself, but underpinned by a strong passenger business case. And for me, that's exciting because it means that the air freight capacity that as a community you're going to create because of that is reliable. It's not dependent upon you having a lot of exporters. It's an opportunity to grow an exporting community, which is underpinned by strong passenger business case. So this is a picture of your aircraft unit load devices. They actually fit into the belly. These AKEs will fit into the belly space of the international aircraft. And in Australia, about 80% of our export uh, cargoes actually go underneath the belly of passenger aircraft. This is very normal. It's usually cheaper than dedicated freighter aircraft as well. So some commercial drivers on the east coast of Australia. As you can see, so this, this data is a little bit old. I think it's uh, 2020. 
Um, but the air freight is a, port, a volume portion of the entire international freight task out of Australia in 2020 was about 0.3%, and it's normal for it to be sub 2%. But as a value, it's usually around 20%, and it was in 2020 as well. So air freight represents a very small amount of the overall freight task, but a very high value amount of the overall freight task. Generally, air freight costs 10 times as much as sea freight. This is our rule of thumb that we use in, in you know, consulting land. And every now and then we go and explore and fully cost and spend hours and hours and hours working out what is the cost of that supply chain. And we find that that's still the answer. There's a rule of thumb. It costs 10 times as much. So it tends to only be used for products which actually really need the speed, which means they want to be fast the whole way along their journey. So from a revenue and directionality and demand point of view, over recent years, there's been a parity in the amount of um, volume demand for both air freight imports and exports from Australia. And that's been interesting. But you'll notice that there's a big difference in the value. So the top line, the, solid two, the two solid lines are the value lines and the dashed lines are the gross weight lines. So the dark blue is the value of the imports and the light blue solid line is the value of the exports. And you can see that even though there's about the same amount of weight, there's a big difference in the value. In fact, if you look at the difference in value and the average value per kilo, you can see it here. It's consistent over time. This has implications for airline revenue. And if you're building a dedicated freighter business car case, this needs to be thought about. Generally, air freight rates into Australia are around about five times as much as they are out of Australia. The business case is import. And our perishable products, et cetera, you look at this uh, average value per kilo, even for our exports, the average value for, per kilo is just under $150 a kilo. We talk about high value perishables. Can anyone nominate a high value perishable that's worth at least 150 bucks a kilo? Not really. So even though we think they're high value and they are really wonderful and we're really proud of our excellent perishable exports, they are only a small amount of the air freight business case. Without the high yielding cargoes to balance it out, you don't have a sustainable business case. For freighters, you're a bit different and this is why it's exciting. The things that drive air freight capacity are either a sustainable passenger case or a high value air freight case. And you have a good passenger business case, which means the passenger business case will drive the development of air freight capacity. So some challenges and opportunities, just reflecting upon the experience I've had so far, um, building the WellCamp air freight business, uh, and subsequently I've written air freight strategy in a number of locations and for state governments, um, and done air freight pre-feasibility in several locations as well. So some of your challenges are going to be that you have an incomplete value chain from an air freight point of view. I haven't looked at it, but I'm sure if you do a value chain assessment, you will find there are gaps in the licensing. There might be gaps in the operational capability so far as the actual equipment that you have to load air freight. Uh, so let's have a think about that. Motivating freight forwarders is going to be a challenge. It is everywhere else. They're terrific businesses. They add an enormous amount of value, but they also have their own investments in their own facilities in different locations, and they prefer to channel freight through their own facilities because they get a return on investment there, right? Fair enough, they're, they're a business. So motivating them to use a new solution is going to need some thought. How do you do that? Sydney Airport has an immense gravitational pull. It has a very established freight and logistics community all around it. Don't underestimate it and make sure we have a think about how to, how to grab cargo from that Cargo that's coming from your region now and going to Sydney Airport is benefiting from a, a whole range of efficiencies that happen there, which you, you will struggle to replicate here. You need to identify those efficiencies and think your way around them. How do you overcome that? Western Sydney Airport has significant intentions and have already indicated them to the market around air freight development. This is also going to suck a whole heap of business towards itself. However, your opportunities, like I said before, is the strength of your passenger business case, Awesome news. Um, I'm really uh, enthused by the degree of leadership and collaboration that you're already demonstrating as a community. Working together and collaborating on this is going to be important. Aligning your trade development 
your economic development, your tourism development and aviation development initiatives to speak to the same destinations is going to be key to developing sufficient economy of scale on any city pair basis to actually drive a good outcome. Air freight used to represent about 8% of global airline revenues. However, during COVID, it grew to about 15% because, of course, there was no passenger revenue. <laughs> but even after COVID, it's expected to play a greater role than it ever did before in the aviation business case because of its role in airline revenue. And your other opportunity here is the degree of high-value industries. And just notice when Amy spoke before, she mentioned um, you know, med tech, technologies, defense and aerospace. This means that even as you grow in the passenger business with these wide body passenger aircraft and you start to fill them out, will you one day have a business case for dedicated freighters? Maybe with those sorts of high value technological industries in your economy, you might grow in that direction. And that's pretty exciting too. So I don't know how we're going for time. Do we want to have questions in the break? People come and see me, or do you want to do questions now? Sure. Yes. So put your questions on Slido. Thanks very much. Thanks, Sarah. That was uh, excellent. You really simplified a lot of complex information there and given us a lot to think about. Um, um, really took me back. You, you started by talking about the you know, not just the importance of launching the hunter to the world, but the world launching into the hunter. Uh, and that that bit around freight forwarders, I honestly, and I worked in the ports industry for 10 years, and, and I probably should have picked that up earlier, but um, that was a really um, important point from, from my perspective how essential that capability is going to be to um, giving certainty to individual producers that they can, they should invest in their value chains um, uh, because we will be able to get their product to market um, is, is a really critical point. Uh, and it was really encouraging to hear uh, the way uh, you thought about or your, your analysis around the opportunity to grow export on the back of a strong passenger business case. Uh, and that, again, gives us something to work with in terms of the, the way this room has been thinking about what we need to do first and the different um, uh, sequencing of, of, uh, of activities where we need to align around policy and activity and, and advocacy. Um, so. Next up, we're going to have uh, morning tea, and then we're going to return for our panel discussion um, and our workshops. On the panel will be uh, Amy Brown, uh, Sarah, Sarah. So I, I keep saying Sarah, Sarah. So uh, Sarah, Sarah. Um, we'll have Professor Mark Hoffman, who is the University of Newcastle's Deputy Vice Chancellor uh, for Academic and Vice President, and then our facilitator will be Samantha Martin Williams who's a non-executive director of the Supply Chain and Logistics Association of Australia and also a, uh, a, a director on Newcastle Airport. And they're going to be discussing priorities for building the Hunter's international connectivity and trade. Uh, again, please ensure you've put your questions on uh, Slido. That'll make for a, a really good session. Uh, links still up on the screen. Um, and then directly after that session, we're going to break in this room to have our workshops uh, uh, here. So please enjoy your morning tea and we'll see you back in here at 11am. Thank you. <laughs>